My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Now, recently, a gentleman from India contacted me and asked me for some advice. He told me that he was 75 years old and he had been experiencing chest discomfort and therefore he'd had to go to his local hospital in India where he was investigated and told that he had heart artery narrowings in all his blood vessels of the heart, you know, coronary blood vessels, and that he needed an urgent bypass operation. Now, since he had been started on some tablets, however, his pains had all gone away and he was now back to being completely asymptomatic. As long as he took the tablets, he had no problem at all. He was able to walk, he wasn't getting any chest pain. So now he was faced with a dilemma because he felt well, but was being advised an urgent operation, which was going to be both very expensive for him to fund, but also it's a very invasive procedure and that understandably scared him. So I asked him, look, you know, your concerns are valid. Have you had a chance to speak to your doctor about your concerns and what does he say? And the patient told me that he had. He, but at the mere prospect of being questioned, his doctor had become quite angry with him and told him that without the operation, there was a very high likelihood that he would either have a massive heart attack or be dead within the next three to six months. This unfortunately scared the patient even more and now he was really completely overwhelmed and lost as to what to do. Should he have the bypass operation in order to live longer? In this video, I wanted to talk about how dangerous stable angina is and whether a heart bypass done for this condition does indeed prolong life. Now, before I start, I would always urge that patients make important decisions like this in concert with their doctors and individual situations may be different. So anything I say in this video should never replace an honest and detailed discussion with your doctor who will know you a lot better than I do. But unfortunately, this gentleman had lost confidence in the doctor that was treating him and therefore wanted my opinion. So in this video, I'm going to talk to you about what I told him, okay? Firstly, I will talk about angina, then I'll talk about the treatments, and finally, I will talk about a very interesting study, which was called the ischemia trial. Now, what is angina and what is stable angina? The heart is a muscle, and therefore, as with any muscle, it needs a blood supply, and when the heart is called on to, doing, to do more work, such as during exercise, more blood is needed to match the increased demand. If for any reason the demand does not match the supply, then the heart muscle will not get the blood it needs and the cells of the muscle will start suffocating. And as these muscle cells start suffocating, the patient will manifest with symptoms of chest discomfort and breathlessness. And he will simply be unable to keep going with whatever is causing the increased demand. So in my patient's case, he couldn't walk beyond a certain distance because at that point, his heart muscle cells were suffocating and he would get discomfort and the discomfort would get worse and worse. So he would have to stop and the discomfort would go away. So when you have chest discomfort, which results from this demand supply mismatch, it is called angina, okay? And when you have angina, which comes on on exertion and is predictable in that a certain amount of exertion brings it on, and if you stop that exertion, it goes away, then that is called stable angina. This is different from unstable angina, where you get the discomfort even when you do not have to exert yourself. So unstable angina is a different, a much more serious condition, but stable angina is when you walk or exert yourself, you get discomfort, you stop, the discomfort goes away, okay? Now, usually angina, uh, this demand supply mismatch, is caused because of progressive narrowings uh, within the blood vessels, which develop due to increasing age, wear and tear, and comorbidities such as diabetes and high blood pressure. And therefore, in most people who have angina, when you examine their heart vessels by a test called angiography, you will expect to find significant narrowings within the blood vessels. So this is not surprising in this gentleman who contacted me. The question is, what do you do about it? Now, any condition can only do two things to us. The condition can impact on our quality of life by causing symptoms, and it may also impact on our length of life by increasing our risk of something bad happening to us in the future. And 
and it can do both. Any condition can impact on our quality of life, quantity of life, or both. And therefore, when we plan management, management has to be geared towards firstly improving quality of life by removing symptoms, but then also we want to say, well, you know, how risky is this condition and can we in some way reduce that risk, i.e. can we give the patient some kind of treatment that may prolong life. Now, assessing the benefit of an intervention designed to improve quality of life is easy. You administer the intervention and the patient will tell you if their quality of life has improved as a consequence. So in this particular gentleman, he was given tablets, he was getting symptoms, the symptoms went away, his quality of life improved. The problem is assessing the benefit of an intervention when you are trying to administer that intervention to try and improve length of life. That is very difficult because there's no real way to be certain that you have prolonged life. You don't know what would have happened to the patient if they didn't have that intervention. You can only guess, you can assume, you can base it on stats, but you can't be absolutely certain. So the only way to know whether what as a doctor you are recommending is worth recommending is to rely on data from studies done in populations of patients who are similar to that individual that is sat in front of you. Now, in angina, both quality of life and length of life can be affected. Patients get angina, that is uncomfortable, their quality of life gets worse, and their length of life may be affected because at the end of the day, if you've got heart artery narrowings, then there's obviously a worry that that could then block off, cause a heart attack, etc. Now, we know that there are three main treatment options in angina, and they depend on the severity and the complexity of the narrowings causing the angina. The three options are, number one, pills. So we give aspirin, beta blockers, nitrates, statins, stents, and heart bypass operations. Whilst pills are an inconvenience, stents and particularly heart bypass operations are pretty big and scary interventions. Now, all three options can definitely improve quality of life by relieving angina. Pills reduce the demand, uh, you know, by slowing the heart down, they can cause the blood vessels to open up transiently, and therefore they can reduce the demand supply mismatch. They don't take the problem away, they just take away the angina. Stents work by mechanically stretching open the narrowing, and bypasses work by bypassing the narrowing by providing another channel for the blood to use to get to where it is needed. Now, as I say, Pills are an inconvenience. Stents and bypasses, however, are bigger and much scarier interventions. And all three interventions improve quality of life. But there has been much debate about whether which of these interventions is advantageous in terms of prolonging life. And this is clearly important to know because if, for example, I know that I have a 90% narrowing in my heart, and yes, someone gives me some pills and that takes away my angina, I would still be worried that the pills were not taking away the narrowing and therefore my knee-jerk reaction would be that I would want that narrowing dealt with either by a stent or a bypass, even though that narrowing was no longer causing me any symptoms because the pills were controlling my symptoms. So the question that we really need to answer is whether there is really any advantage to having a stent or a bypass operation if a person has been rendered symptom-free by taking tablets, a bit like the gentleman that had contacted me. So this is where this really interesting study comes in. It was called the Ischemia Trial. It was published in 2020 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And in this study, they wanted to find out how dangerous stable angina was in terms of causing death or hospitalization from heart attacks and also whether stents or bypasses offered an advantage in terms of life prolongation over and above pills, especially if the pills were already controlling the symptoms. So the investigators uh, studied over 5,000 patients with stable angina, and then they randomized them to either pills or pills plus tests to assess the magnitude of the problem and a bypass or stents to fix the problem. And they wanted to see whether there was any difference in outcomes. 
the results over a mean uh, over a median time frame of 3.2 years showed that there were 144 deaths so a relatively small number of deaths given the initial population uh, in the group that was just given the pills and 145 deaths in the group that uh, ha had the pills, the tests, and the stents and bypasses. So there was really no difference. And the study therefore concluded that putting patients who have been rendered asymptomatic with pills through stents and bypasses did not confer any additional advantages. And therefore the only reason to contemplate stents or a bypass operation is for quality of life reasons, i.e. if tablets were not controlling your symptoms they should not be offered for life prolongation purposes. What this means is that if you have a 90% narrowing in a blood vessel in your heart and it is not causing any symptoms or your symptoms have been controlled with tablets, then there is no advantage to having a stent or a bypass to fix it because it does not confer any advantage in terms of what happens to you in the future. Based on this trial, it is likely that if you have angina, the doctors will now start trying you on some pills. And only if you have ongoing symptoms, despite taking tablets, will the doctor organize more tests and send you for consideration of stents or bypasses. So on the basis of this data, I was able to reassure the gentleman who had contacted me that as he was asymptomatic, there was no overwhelming reason for him to face the prospect of an operation. His risks of dying or having a heart attack were nowhere near as high as was being made out to him, and it would be completely reasonable for him to decline the operation as long as he remained asymptomatic. Now, one particular reason that I wanted to do this video is that stents and bypasses can be very profitable procedures, and sometimes unscrupulous doctors may scare patients into having these procedures even though the patient is not symptomatic and actually has a reasonable quality of life. This is not medical negligence. This is something far worse. This is medical malintent. And unfortunately, this is rife in many countries, especially places like India and Pakistan. And I would therefore always recommend that a doctor who recommends something and then justifies it by saying, I'm the doctor here, I know what I'm talking about, you're a patient, you don't know anything, and therefore just do get on and do what I say, is not a doctor worth having. A doctor should be patient, open, and honest. And a bad doctor will scare, enfeeble, and enslave the patient. A good doctor, on the other hand, will educate, empower, and liberate the patient. So I hope you found this useful, and I would love to hear your thoughts.